The following interview was conducted with John R. Rice, the William Brooks Fortune Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Computer Science and Professor of Mathematics, a courtesy appointment for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, July 21, 2010 in Stewart Center, the television studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon, Professor Rice, and thank, thank you. you. Let's start with, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, my father was working for the telephone company at the time. I lived in Tulsa until I was four, because I remember nothing about that. Then I moved to a number of small towns in Oklahoma, uh, most of which even people in Oklahoma haven't heard of. I moved to Wanette, Porham, Sayre, that's actually a decent sized town. Do the towns still exist? Some of them. Okay. Sarah, well, some of them have gotten together. Uh, no. no. Some of them disappeared. Like the next town I lived in was called Highway. Highway? Highway. It was four miles to the nearest paved road. It had a school, a store, a church, and one, two, three, four, five houses, and a cornfield. Oh, how <laughs> interesting. Oh, my goodness. Oh. And then I moved from there to a town called Colony. Uh, and Newcastle, all of these very small towns. I mean, Your father got transferred? or you know, He was a school teacher. Oh, okay. So he was moving from school to school sure, teaching okay. and so forth. Yeah. So by this time I was, uh, you know, in seventh grade or something like that. Finally moved to Osage, Oklahoma. Uh, I stayed there two or three years. Uh, I think I must have been in the eighth grade when I left. Um, and then I moved to Ethiopia, which is not a usual place to go, but <laughs> my father got a position in Ethiopia as director of a technical high school, so we moved to Ethiopia, and I spent three years there. Okay. Uh, the first year I went to a commercial school, didn't learn anything. Uh, my father realized that. So, Was it an English language school? Yeah. The government was conducting all their secondary education in English for several good reasons, which I don't need to go into now, but uh, like a lack of textbooks in the native language, for example, a lack of teachers, and so on. Um, so my father decided that I should go to the French school. Uh, I just had this problem, I didn't speak French. So, <laughs> but you thought the school was good, probably. <laughs> Pardon? He thought the school was pretty good then. Yeah, it yeah. was. It, the French government has a set of schools around the world. They have school teachers from France, and they follow exactly the same curriculum as they follow in France. So they really are good schools. And the English also have a similar school system, but uh, somehow we decided to go to the French school. So I was in, I think, the third grade class, or what's equivalent to the grade class. They have a different system for grades. For uh, two terms, they have the trimester system there. And also, every day after class, I spent an hour with the teacher trying to learn French. And then at the third term, I was promoted a couple of grades. And then that summer, I went to Paris with uh, a family friend by myself, and spent the summer in Paris, and uh, again, to learn French. And then when I came back, I could actually enter and participate in my regular Right, uh, as a regular class. student. Right. Sure. And so I spent a year there. Uh-huh. Also, because the uh, school systems there ran on a sort of long morning, short afternoon uh, program, and the afternoon was spent in lessons in the native language. Of course, I didn't have a chance there. didn't even know French, never mind Amharic. So my father found a solution to that. He was director of a technical high school for uh, carpentry, mechanics, electricians, welding, and so forth. So he said I would come to the laboratories in the technical school. So I spent two years learning welding and blacksmithing. Very useful. Oh, yeah. Uh, my future career. Anyway, oh, I survived. Sure. And uh, had, uh, What was it like living there at that time? 
Was that when Haile Selassie was? Now, Haile Selassie was emperor. Okay. It was very civilized. It was right after World War II, and the company, its country, was in somewhat disarray. Um, when the Italians came in, uh, they shot everybody of note who was loyal to the emperor. And when the emperor came back, he shot everybody who collaborated with the Italians of note. So there was an acute shortage of all kinds of trained people, Sounds you know, like, like it, school yeah. teachers and sure. so on. So all the professional people. Right. And so uh, Haile Selassie was a shrewd guy, so he divided up the economy into pieces. And so the Americans had the school system, uh, the French had the railroads, uh, the Swedes had the airlines, the English had the army, and so forth. He didn't want anybody to gain control of that. And there <laughs> Interesting were, arrangement. There were around 20,000 Italians who were trapped after World War II in Ethiopia who he would not let leave because they were the electricians, the mechanics, and all that kind of people running the country. And then in all of Africa, there's a large community of Greeks and Armenians and sure. Egyptians and so forth that are running the grocery stores and lots of things sure. like that. Sure, okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Was the school that your father was teaching at, was that uh, a private school or? No, it's a government school. Government school, okay. Mm -hmm. And did, were there girls and boys? No, only boys. Only boys. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Okay. The French school had girls. Okay. Not very many, but it had girls. Uh -huh. I mean, it, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's just because there were fewer French girls around, or fewer girls wanted to go there, sure, I guess right. you'd say. Right. Were the students lived in that t in the city, and they went right. to the school? Right. Everybody was local. It uh -huh. was the capital, which is a large city. Sure. So even oh, yeah. in those days, it had a very substantial population and a considerable foreign population, although right. Americans were few and far between. In those times, right. Yeah, yeah. I think the three years I lived there, there was never more than one or two teenagers in the city, American teenagers besides myself. Wow. Interesting. So, uh, uh, it was Different type of high school. Right. Growing up. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then what happened after the, uh, you were there, what, three years? Three years. Mm -hmm. uh, I came back to... Um, the States, went back to Oklahoma and entered Oklahoma State University and uh, I decided to major in chemical engineering. Uh, I started out in that. I didn't have any academic problems but I was unhappy because engineering schools, and Purdue does this too, have all these requirements for the students. You have to take this, that, and the other thing, blah, 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 blah. I didn't care much for that, so I discovered in the math department, you mean half of your courses are electives, so I switched to mathematics. I want to pick what I wanted, right? <laughs> right. Something like what that. I wanted to pick. Right. What I was really good at. Yeah, so I switched to mathematics, and it didn't cost me anything as far as graduating. Sure. And I... Did you live on campus? Uh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. you did. Okay. Now, yeah, were, where were your parents? Were they? Did they? There was teaching school in Oklahoma again, in oh, another okay. town, a suburb of Oklahoma City. Okay. And uh, and so I was a regular student there. Okay. Any student clubs that you belong to? Did you join any or? Oh, uh, so I had honorary societies. Uh, okay. Uh, my grandparents also lived in Stillwater, which is an Oklahoma State University. So sure. I had an aunt and uncle who lived there. So I did have. You know, contacts, and uh, I knew the city. Place very to go well. for the good meals, right? <laughs> right. Home cooking, <laughs> all <of> those things. <laughs> right. And uh, so, anyway, I graduated in in three years, and but then I was an ROTC, which takes four years. So I decided well, I had to stay one more year. So I stayed two more years and got a master's degree. Uh, and uh, then after I graduated from that, I went into the army for. Uh, six months and fiddled around, but then I went to Caltech. Where did you go in the Army? What were you doing for that time? You weren't... It, well, I was in something called the Army Security Agency. Uh, which where is, were they based? In Washington or...? Uh, their main base was in uh, suburb of Boston, but you had to spend two months in infantry officers training camp in uh, Alabama, Fort Benning. Uh, being an officer is better than being an enlisted man, but it isn't fun. <laughs> 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 it 
<laughs> You're I running agree. around in the middle of the night, you know, jumping out of helicopters and all this kind of stuff. Being prepared. <laughs> right. And then when I got to Fort Devens, I was in the Army Security Agency, and even though the Army had been known that I was coming for, it was almost seven years by then, when I arrived, I didn't have a clearance. And you have to have a top secret clearance to be in the Army Security Agency. Oh, so, I would think so. So I was allowed in the um, inner compound, but I had to wear a big tag over my uh, neck with a big U on it for uncleared. I could never be left alone, even going to the toilets. Uh, and of course, I couldn't do anything with any security equipment. So I just sat around. Piddled with computers, my sign. <laughs> crossword puzzles. For what an interesting experience. <laughs> that tops. I don't hear many of those. <laughs> that was very educational about yeah, how I'm the sure, army works. Yeah, I'm sure. Right. Yeah, I look back on that with fond memories. <laughs> when I see people with placards, I can really know what it's like. Yeah. So anyway, and then after that, I went to the uh, National Bureau of Standards for a year on a postdoc. In, uh, in a math uh, department there. And then I got a job at General Motors, which isn't too likely for a mathematician, but uh, uh, it was an offer I couldn't resist. The salary, well, I think I got $10,000 a year, which was really a big salary in those days. And when I got there, I had no duties. Where were we, this in Detroit? In Detroit, okay. yeah, at their research center. Mm -hmm. And after I'd been there for a while, I discovered that and I'll skip this part of the story, but the math department in the research center was created so that department heads' salary could be justified. Uh, um, and I won't go into that. But so for four years I was there with no duties. And what did so you do? I wrote books and wrote papers. I did research. <laughs> okay. Got and my public publication uh, cycle rolling, right? Right. There you go. Uh, but I decided there wasn't any long-term future in this place, so I decided <laughs> to go someplace else. And go to, Were you uh, married at that time? Yeah, I'd oh, okay. been married uh, okay. uh, uh, before I went to Caltech. Sure, okay. Um, and um, so I started looking for a position. And of course, I had a PhD in mathematics. There weren't any computing uh, departments in those days. But I was interested in computers. I'd always been interested in computers. Even as an undergraduate, I actually wrote an article on Oklahoma State engineer on computing in the uh, 50s. Um, and I interviewed quite a few places, and I had offers from Purdue and uh, Texas and Stanford. But I didn't like the ones from Stanford and Texas because they weren't faculty positions. I would be on the staff of the computing center. Mm. And Purdue had just had a real computer science department started up where you had real faculty positions, real op And a op real department. A real department. Right. So I said, I'm going there. So I did. And I think I was maybe the fourth or fifth faculty member of the department. Did head. Professor Conti, he was the first head, did he start the department? And you just he was the first head. Okay. Phil Haas actually, it was his idea. Okay to create a division of mathematical sciences with mathematics, statistics, and computing. And then he knew Sam Conti from someplace, I don't know where. Sure. Uh, and he had hired Sam to be the head. Okay. And, and that the, started the department, is that yeah, correct? And okay. there were a couple of people on the faculty, like John Steele, who had a, was from electrical engineering, but he was interested in computing. He has directed a computing center for many years. Sure. Uh, was there. And Saul Rosen was there. Uh, already, and Walter Gauchy came the year before I did. I'd actually met him at the National Bureau of Standards uh, when I was there. I didn't know him well, but sure. he was there. So I was probably the fourth uh, real faculty member. No, oh, there's Bob Corfidge, too. Uh, he may have came the year I did, but about the same time. And, right. But everybody was pretty And the math perfect. science building was built, and that's where you were housed, is that right? No, we were in recitation. Oh, okay. Yeah, math science had not been built yet. Okay. So we were in the attic of the recitation building. <laughs> well, the top floor. It's not really an attic, but it's not a regular floor. And it's floor. not an elevator either. <laughs> right, no elevators. <laughs> right. Uh, One of our older buildings. <laughs> yeah. So, of course, we... Uh, as well as the math department, statistics were thrilled when the math sciences building was 
built, which was a very nice facilities and had, you know, state-of-the-art computing sure. operations over there. Did they have any computers in, were you able to use any computers in recitation? Did they have any? No, at all? they didn't have any oh, real computing. So where did you have to go to what? There was just someplace they had some key okay. punch machines, but you know, they didn't have terminals in those days. Key punch machines, you turn your cards in someplace, the next day you get something back. Kind right, of yeah. The service is what was possible in those days. Right. And, uh, well, then go on with uh, transpired how it grew in the department. And this was the first, am I correct in that the first computer science department was established at Purdue? Right, the first okay. one. Okay. Right. And it grew slowly but surely. Right. And uh, went into the uh, Mass Science Building, and computer science had a whole floor. And in the beginning, you know, we had more room we knew what to do with. Sure. Uh, Which is often the case. Right. Uh, but it wasn't long until we were running out of room. But it was a number of years we were in, in the Mass Science Building. I recall, uh, well, one of the things that people hadn't foreseen was that you would need lab space in the department. Because in the beginning, there was a central computer which had its own whatever. Uh, but they did, there were no personal computers or. There was uh, no lab for students at all, right? Right. Well, yeah, they oh. were, they had labs for students. Oh, did they? But okay. they, again, were uh, in the basement kind of thing or in some other building. Uh, but faculty began to get machines to do this, that, and the other. Some people wanted graphics. Some people just wanted a, a terminal and a personal computer or whatever. And, uh, and, of course, we were growing faster than the math department and statistics were because students were beginning to get interested in computing sure. and enrollments were pretty wild. And I taught classes with 400 students in them and oh. <laughs> that kind of thing. Oh. So biggest auditoriums are in the university were being used for some of the classes. Sure. Um, but we were there a long time. And the, in the math science building. Yeah. Right. Once we even I believe it was shortly after Haas became provost, or maybe before. Anyway, somebody heard a report that the provost was coming over to look at the situation in the, in the CS department. So everyone scurried around, even though we were really packed, bringing in more equipment so we were absolutely wall to wall packed. You couldn't move. <laughs> Let alone get in the door, right? Right. I hear you. Yeah, so eventually we uh, were told we would get uh, the old gymnasium, Memorial Gymnasium, which is now Haas Hall. Sure. And it took a year or two for them to actually do that. And uh, Well, they had a lot of changes to make in the Oh, yeah, it was, you know, it was the women's it was a gym, gym right? and a swimming pool <laughs> and all that kind of thing. <laughs> so it, it was just, they really, it was... Uh, I went over there like everybody else to see how it was going. And at one stage, you know, they just had a steel frame with brick walls around it, and that was all that was there. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a hole in the ground. And, hmm. and they built a new building in, inside it. And sure. We were there for a long time, and of course, it must have multiplied our space by a factor of four or five oh, yeah. or something like this that. This was you were, when you were the head. Uh, when you moved to Memorial Gym, wasn't it? I yeah, I, was, I became head not. Before head. we moved in there, I believe, oh. but it was a it was a similar time. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I wasn't head yet. Okay. Yeah. Let's Conte talk about was head for a long time. Before we do that, let's talk. A, can you talk a little bit about mm. your research? Uh, so okay. Kind of, yeah. Well, I started out in mathematics and I and applied math, and I wrote a lot of papers and uh, some books on uh, approximation theory and uh, which was the especially in mathematics that I was in. Um, but then I got interested in software, and I wrote some books on mathematical software, which was a sort of new title and about, you know, something about how you can do mathematics software for mathematical purposes, sure, let's call okay. it. And uh, that was... Um, you got some quite, and you did that. You developed that LPAC system. Right. For researchers you might want to make a would make a comment on that. Okay, LPAC. Well, there was uh, already it was very well recognized that uh, 
the idea that everybody's going to write their own program doesn't work very well. <laughs> that, that complicated programs are very time consuming and uh, uh, take a great deal of knowledge about computers, et cetera, et cetera. So what you really have to have is software that other people can use who they know what they want to do, but they don't want them to learn how computers work and all that kind okay. of thing. And uh, that was, in some sense, the, the idea behind mathematical software, to develop a layer of, of s on top of regular software systems where you could communicate with the computer in the terminology of mathematics. You could write down equations, and you could say, solve this, and plot that, and that kind of thing. The kind of thing that all kinds of PCs now do routinely and right. everybody you can thinks do that's natural. You do a lot of modeling and things of that sort. Right, that right. kind of stuff. And um, how did the growth of the types of computers, did that impact on your research? You, they became more sophisticated, could do more things. Well, it, may, it allowed you to do things you couldn't do sure. uh, before. And that, gra I mean, you could become more and more ambitious. As, sure. And uh, of course, that's still going on. That, uh, oh, yeah. Um, but in some sense, the, you know, it's sort of like cars, you know. Uh, if you look at a Model T and you look at the car you have today, there's a huge difference, but right. basically <laughs> there's the same pattern is there. I understand. Right. It's just uh, faster, bigger, better, and that kind of thing. Sure. Uh, right. And, I mean, in computing, artificial intelligence, which is still getting off the ground, will bring in a new dimension where, uh, you know, the computers will actually be not just a tool, but they'll actually be able to, uh, to take their own initiative to get things done, sure. and know how the methods work and so forth. You don't have to know which method to use. You just say, I want to solve that problem, and it'll know what to do to do that right. kind of thing. Okay. And, and, but you, uh, and you got, in the early days, funding for it, did you, uh, was that, uh, outside funding, or did you get internal? I didn't get research? very much internal funding. I okay. got some, but it was right. mostly outside. Mostly, uh, as I know, yeah, Wright Patterson Department of Defense were a couple of yeah. agencies uh, that helped. Yeah, involved. the universities didn't have a whole lot of money for internal funding mm -hmm. and research. They still don't have a whole lot of money. Sure, uh, right. So, yeah, you if you wanted to do anything serious, you had to get outside right. funding to hire particularly in something like uh, computing or uh, like in engineering and so forth. You know, you have to have assistants, you have to have helpers, you have to have equipment. Uh, you, university can't afford to right. buy all of that for everybody. So. Right. You were mentioning earlier yeah. about the labs. The labs have changed over time, haven't they? What were they like in the earlier days? Would they have not individual computers, would they? Uh, well, they would have, labs? of course, the early labs basically had key punch machines. So you would come into the lab, if that's what you want to call it, that's what it was. Sure, right, right okay. And you would sit there and just type and punch cards. Okay, okay. And you'd get a deck of cards and then you would... Then you have to go someplace and, and, and put them in the machine and they'd yeah. run, right? Yeah. Well, something? actually you had to give them to somebody because there was a big queue, so you didn't want to wait there unless you happened I'll to own the tomorrow, computer. Right? Right. Unless you're ahead of the computing center. <laughs> With my cards, right? <laughs> right? And you'd come back the next day. And, oh, okay. Uh, and Interesting. Or maybe two or three hours later you'd yeah. come back. Yeah. I've and, heard of that. I, I never had... I've yeah. known people that have used them, but I, I just never had occasion to... Well, the and day. there was a huge bottleneck in the whole process of oh, these I key bet. punch machines and so forth. And uh, one of my best friends, a guy that Lynch is his name, who uh, was a professor also in, uh, here at Purdue and also at General Motors, he, he came uh, uh, after he went, he went to Texas when I left GM. Uh, but uh, after two or three years, he came here. Okay. And we lived right across the street from each other. And so we used to go into the school about one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Get my cards run, right? Because <laughs> right, you could actually, didn't have to wait to use a key punch machine. You'd go down there at one, you could spend an hour or two, get all your things done, submit your jobs, and then come home. <laughs> <laughs> That's the night shift, right? right. <laughs> Something like that. Oh, mm. dear. <laughs> the uh, enrollment in, in the department in the earlier days, did it, was it large or did it increase over time? Or Well, there was almost immediately a 
substantial demand for b beginning programming courses, both for the business students and the science and engineering students. Sure. And electrical engineering also had a uh, program in engineering, which a lot of engineers took their courses too. But it was uh, a large demand for what we would now consider freshman, sophomore courses. Sure, right. uh, they probably had higher numbers in those days. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there were there were big courses. I I can remember teaching in the largest rooms that Purdue had. Wow! Uh, and the, you know the class was full. <laughs> they couldn't get in any more students because there's such a demand. Did and they make this a requirement, or the people, or, or was it? Well, it depend on your what you're majoring. <laughs> right. In. Okay. Obviously, CS students had to take these courses, sure. but a lot of engineers had to take them, and uh, science students, depending on what kind of science you're in, you had more or less. Right. And those requirements gradually grew as the disciplines became more into computing. Right. And, uh, right. And that then involved when, when uh, I still remember uh, the first terminal I saw that you could actually do computing on as opposed to a key punch machine. One of the graduate students for his PhD thesis in computer science had and designed one and bought some equipment and so forth, and he actually had one in the department, which, uh, while well, it looked great at the time, now we'd think, my God, <laughs> I can't put up with anything like that. <laughs> I mean, it was slow. You'd go plunk, plunk, plunk. <laughs> it's one, called 10 one, watt. Yeah, you could, you know, if you typed at regular speed, nothing would happen. Right? <laughs> so. Oh, dear. <clears throat> the uh, I was going to ask you one thing, that computational science and engineering, is that program still going? You started that introducing uh, No, it's not going. It's, okay. It lasted for a long time. And, and it, you and Professor Hustis did that, huh? Right. And interdisciplinary is really, you know, Yeah, front it was and an interdisciplinary now. program, and there were, uh, I don't remember how many, 12, 20 faculty of various numbers uh, associated with it in various departments, of course, sure. several from computer science. But uh, it had some courses for uh, tailored for people who wanted to use computers as as opposed to being but scientist type people right. okay. who uh, the, instead of just being PhD students in computer science or professors in computer science that was the idea and there was a lot of interest in those times it gradually faded away I think primarily because the disciplines began to absorb computing into their own curricula. Their own okay. They didn't need an interdisciplinary program. Right, because uh, they're all doing their own thing. Right, right. And they, they had faculty of their own that could teach the courses, and uh, but that program lasted 10, 15 yeah, years. It was a good like. start, and was at the beginning when the right. interdisciplinary, very right. good. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little about department head? Want to make some comments on that? How did you have to do, did you succeed someone, or? Uh, yeah, I believe uh, Sama was department head before I was. Oh. Uh, of course, Conti was head for a long time, and um, I I wasn't anxious to become head, but then I looked at two or three people who wanted to be head, and I said maybe I better take the job. <laughs> <laughs> I think I better <laughs> sign up, right? <laughs> so uh, I I agreed to it and. Uh, I don't know. I didn't find being ahead was that much of a problem. Uh, and, you know, there's some busy work, but I had good assistant department heads and good secretaries and so forth. So I didn't put a too big a cramp into my research activities. And of course, I stopped teaching. Sure. Uh, when I did that, so right. I came out close to even uh, by doing that. And, uh, and you mentioned certainly some of the challenges and things that uh, you did to mm -hmm. face. And they, uh, there are initiatives and challenges mm -hmm. that you have to face. That goes yeah. with the territory. Yeah, yeah, and you know, you're always, of course, every department head doesn't have enough money, but <laughs> that right, kind of right. thing. Uh, but there was also the problem of uh, getting recognition and respect among the. Uh, um, other faculty uh, that you know, computer science was a real thing. Uh, uh, well, to give you an example of how really outrageous things can get, uh, there was a um, 
a guy at General Motors who was actually a, a, got his master's degree at Harvard under Burkhoff, who's one of the most famous mathematicians in, in the history of the U.S., and he came to General Motors for a few years, same time I was there. And when I left uh, to come to Purdue, he went to Michigan and got his Ph.D., and we hired him on the faculty about three years later when he graduated. And it came up, and he, he, he was super. He is the best scientist that has ever been on the faculty at Purdue. He is the only Purdue faculty who has ever won the National Medal of Science. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with that medal. Who it's, is? I know the medal. Who you know, is in? Who Carl is De Boer is his oh, name. Oh, okay. Uh, he was up for promotion. It was early promotion, but he was super. In those days, the promotions committee was still integrated. There were math, stat, and CS, one committee. And the mathematicians said, oh, no, computing isn't that hard. It's too early. Well, you know, we're not going to promote him. They turned him down. He said, Fully on you, and he went to Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And yeah. Uh, yeah, he had a super distinguished career. Uh, when you came, that was mm -hmm. during the bearing when you were the head. So then it, you had development and advancement sort of started yeah. with he had yeah. Vision Twenty One. Actually, Hubdy was head when I came. Oh, uh, but but when we were department head, when right. you came, yeah. Uh, yeah. when you became department head, as Dr. Barron came in yeah. eighty three, right. and mm -hmm. that's when development and advancement. And he had Vision Twenty One. Right. Yeah, he, he was he trying campaign. hard. Right. He was a difficult uh, guy oh, in many yeah. ways, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I had some dealings. You know, I went to Washington two or three times with him to uh, try to raise money for sure. the computing of computer science. And I mean, he, he, uh, he had good ideas, but he was in many ways a difficult person to deal with. <laughs> a little bit different. <laughs> was, was it during this time that other uh, academic institutions were also developing computer science departments. Oh yeah, they okay. they grew like weeds. Uh, oh wow! Uh, in, in starting in the seventies, I mean, there, there was a question in there about the rankings. I mean, yeah. in the beginning there wasn't any problem. It's only ten departments. You're right here in the top ten, right? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I, uh, well, you can be. What are you? I'm in the top ten. There's only ten. That's great. There almost no other department. You got to put that in your department. biography. That's good. That's <laughs> a good one-liner. But uh, you know they, they now they've really uh, every everybody has just oh, like sure. they have history and they wait whatever. for that issue to come out <laughs> right. in advance, right? I hear uh, you. But uh, it was uh, yeah, it was there, there was in, in the seventies and eighties just just sprouted up everywhere. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What about you? Did, did, took some sabbaticals, didn't you? I did you, did. was this while you were the head or, or not? Yeah, I okay. took sabbaticals while I was the head. Okay. I uh, went to Caltech once and I went to the University of Washington once. Yeah. And, uh, How was it to going back to Caltech? Had you kept, sort of kept in touch over time or? Oh yeah, uh, although the personnel had changed there. The, sure. the math department, and Caltech is a very small place. I mean, you know, it's not as big as the physics department. The whole university isn't as big as the physics is, department is here. Is that right? I had no idea. No, I've never, I, I've never seen no, it. it's, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, super smart students, excellent faculty, but it's very small. You know, I think there were seven PhD students in my, they don't have a master's degree program unless you flunk out at Caltech and uh, the, in my class. And it was sort of sobering because when we got there, the seven of us, there were two other graduate students in the math department. Everybody else had failed their exams and left. And these two guys promptly <laughs> failed their exams and left. <laughs> and you came, right? <laughs> right. So the seven oh, wow. of us were very diligent in preparing for those exams. God, yeah. Oh, and, that is and a sobering five influence. Of, five of us passed. <laughs> well, I, I know now, and even I learned later, that the, the faculty really themselves decided we're crazy. <laughs> you know, we get great students, and we're flunking everybody. <laughs> so there's something wrong with us, not them. <laughs> so, something needs to be looked at in yeah, some way. Oh, so, it was a it was a scary place. Now, is, that's undergraduate as well as graduate, isn't right. it? Right. 
What's the undergraduate enrollment is that? That's probably not very large. No, it's four or five hundred students. Wow. And oh, so smart. I I used to be, you know, I'd been teaching as, a, as an assistant for a couple of years, and I was used to just, you know, making out exams and, uh, you know, just look at the exams and I'd look at the question and I'd, I'd see what the answer is. Well, there they had, of course, the education is definitely better organized there than it is most universities. The, even though the TAs had something, the, the guy who was running the course made up the exams. So the first midterm exam came up, and I went into class to hand out the exams and asked her questions. And, you know, somebody said, how do you work the first problem? <laughs> I said, I, can, I couldn't work the first problem. I couldn't work the second problem. I couldn't work the third problem. I finally got the fourth one. And, you know, a third of the class made 100% on that exam. <laughs> I can see why. So I worked harder after that. <laughs> These are experiences that are momentous and long, long right. serving. <laughs> Oh, I guess the next thing I was going to ask you about was the the 40th anniversary in the new building. You want to make a couple of comments on that? The, For the research, the new building and the 40th anniversary sort of they had mm -hmm. the, about the same time. That was uh, a big, big thing. Yeah, there was a big celebration, and it was right. very impressive. And I'm, uh, uh, you know, I I think it went great. I don't have any. I I think I mentioned to you. I think there's some video someplace of yeah. it, but I can't. I don't we'll have, have a to copy try to of track it. it. Uh, but I'm pretty sure there is, and there was a very nice program. And it's a great that building is a great location, don't the, you think? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it just fits in there really nice. Yeah, yeah. and uh, of course the uh, the new CS building was a you know sure. godsend for the department, and it's still a you know a very modern, very nice, uh, very uh, nice well right. equipped yeah. uh, facility. The, yeah, the um, ACM transactions on mathematical software. You're the founding editor. Right. For research, how did how did you came up with the idea for this, or tell us how it came about? Yes, yeah, sort of. I was uh, involved in ACM, that's the Association sure. for Computing Machinery, and you know I was on some sort of editorial boards and so on. And they had a a couple of journals and so forth. And uh, but you know this computing field was was growing, right. and so. Uh, I think I proposed, but I won't swear who proposed, sure. that we have a journal, you know, on a specialty as opposed to the whole field. Right. Because, because the field was, is growing and needs a specialty to Right. Pull it you in. just, you know, you, you don't, <laughs> you can't have uh, that much coming out of one, one journal. Right. So I proposed that we have a transactions on mathematical software, and that was actually natural because mathematics was, uh, more mature as a user of computing. There's a lot more interaction between mathematics and computing than, say, you know, now like you know, historians do computing now. And, right. But in the beginning, it was mathematicians and electrical engineers, basically, that were doing, doing it. That's computing. Right. So mathematical software seemed like a, a natural way to go. And it turned out uh, right away there were plenty of papers and no, no problems, uh, plenty of subscribers. and. ACM now has, I don't know, 12 or 15 transactions, I don't know how many, uh, of various kinds. Sure. Right. Yeah, that's uh, good. One thing I, meant, I was going to ask you when you were the department head, did you have an advisory committee at all from uh, a former either alumni advisory committee or an industrial or uh, some There department? was a, a, such a committee, oh. and they were useful. They were not, well, I think most of them are the same kind of thing. So they, they're good sounding boards. Right. You know, okay. they, they, I don't recall any real conflicts sure. or uh, ideas that wowed everybody or that kind of right. thing. But it, it it's just good for departments to have such. Uh, right, and many do have. Yeah, right. that, those kind of things. Right, right. and I don't, you know, we weren't the f we may have been the first one in computing to have right. one just because we're the first department. But right. it wasn't. Wasn't a novelty in university departments right. to have such, and it's sharing you know, what you're right. doing, what your your objectives right. and changes and things, and it, it works out. And they can get right. the message, and it affects uh, mm. students coming to school right. too. You know, impacts on that. Um, were you ever a faculty fellow at any of the dorms? 
You know that's no, right. okay. I wasn't. Um, we'd like to talk about your awards and honors, of which you have many. Congratulations. <laughs> For the National Academy of Engineering, that's very nice. How did you, did you find, no, were you notified of that? Did you just get a letter or did somebody call you? Yeah, somebody called me and said I'd been elected. Oh, <laughs> there you go, okay, okay. So, but they, uh, you're a fellow of uh, the American Association of Advancement of Science and the Association of Computer Machinery. That's a very nice yeah. honor. One of your yeah. earlier ones that you got was that uh, Forsyth Distinguished Lectureship. Could you tell us what th that involved? Well, it was uh, George Forsyth was one of the, the founders of computing uh, he, in the business he, well before I was, and he uh -huh. was very well known. And somebody decided to have this. Was it was it here at Purdue that they had yeah, the lecture? Yeah, but he here? gave some lectures other places. Oh, too. okay, okay. Yeah, but it was it was a small event in the sense that it didn't. Uh, take a whole lot of your time. It, sure. You know, you gave three or four lectures. Right. And, and it's, you, as you can imagine, I was giving lectures all the time. So, right. But it was a nice, prestigious thing. You know, they were at conferences and such things as that. Right. Uh, but um, it that's was... Very, that's very right. nice, though. Mm -hmm. and, and you got the Sigma Psi Research Achievement Award. That's one at, at Purdue. Right. That's uh, nice. Yeah, I, I, I appreciated that. I'm sure that's <laughs> right. right. Um, this, uh, the Silver Core of the uh, I IFIP. Would tell us what that award entails? Uh, IFIP is the International Federation sure. of Information Processing right. Societies, and they have a system of recognizing people, and uh, they call it one of the, the Silver Core, and they recognize maybe 10, 15 people a year. The number has grown gradually as, sure. as computing uh, has grown because IFIP, like everything else in computing, started out a very small organization with uh, out uh, much mm -hmm. uh, attendance and so forth. And now, you know, they have meetings and they have 2,000 people there or something. I, right. you know, it was a mob scene. Right, yeah. All right. That's yeah. very nice, mm -hmm. though. And also the charter member of the Great Book of Teachers. That's well, that, that was a big surprise to me. <laughs> but I. Yeah, appreciate That's very it. nice. And yeah. for researchers, it's the one that's at Purdue. Yeah. And there's the plaque, and you can yeah. look at it. Yeah. The, they had a symposium, the ASM Transactions of Mathematical Software had a symposium for your 65th birthday. Right. Can yeah. you tell us a comment on that? Well, uh, it, it ran. It's a nice honor. It was a very nice, nice honor. And it was, was it held here? It was held here, okay. and it was the usual kind of symposium in the sense that, you know, they invited, you know, 10 people. to 15, something in that range of people to speak, and ACM actually funded the, the expenses and so forth, and they had this meeting here, and, uh, and I smiled the whole time. <laughs> and enjoyed it to the hill, right. right? Gee, I'm 65, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah. The Professional Association, to, of which you are, you were the chair of the ACM Special Interest uh, Group on nu Numerical Mathematics in 70 right. and 73 and the chair in Computing Research Association in 91 to 93. Right. Do you still keep active in any of the associations? I'm not active in uh, okay. these things anymore. No. Okay. No. Um, and then the International Federation for Information Processing, that working group also, right. and International Association for Mathematics and Computers and Simulation, vice president and trustee. Are you still involved with that one? No, and in fact, that uh, organization has uh, faded away. Oh, okay. Right. The, uh, the guy who uh, organized it, and it was it was very active for uh, a decade or two. Sure. Uh, but, you know, somehow a lot of other organizations came into existence and so forth, and it gradually has uh, Disarted, disappeared. Disappeared. Faded away, right? <laughs> faded okay. away, that's right. I want to come, uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, significantly recognize you for all the conferences and publications yeah. that you've given. That's yeah. very nice. Your yeah. publication list is excellent, starting with the early ones. I always like to look at the early ones and then look at the trend through it. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. My best wishes. It's good. The um, Aaron Technologies, your co-founder, you are, um, is our ex Arxan. Yeah. You want to make a comment on that? How that came? That's a local one for the researchers. It's right. in town. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Well, it started sort of accidentally, and, and this, you know, there wasn't any plan to create anything. Um, but 
I'd become a little bit interested in computer security. Of course, almost everybody in computing is a little sure. bit interested in it. And um, uh, Mike Atala and myself and Tim Korb were discussing these kind of things and uh, you know how you could prevent this, that, and the other kind of bad things happening. And uh, so we decided, well, we would try to check into something, see how these things worked. Uh, you know, because the big, the number one problem then, and still the number one problem, is software piracy. Yeah. Uh, and so we had a, uh, a graduate, an undergraduate actually, and he said, well, let's, let's see what we can do with the guy. Let's, let's get some, one of these license uh, packages and uh, see why it works and have him, you know, install it and so forth. And so we did. And I remember I met with him one week and said, we got this thing. And we talked earlier about the whole business. So he was happy to learn about getting into that area. And we talked about this thing, and I said, you know, here it is, and here's, you know, here's the disk that has this program on it, and so forth. Here's how it works. And uh, I said, well, why don't you try it out and see how it works? Tell us what happens. And so he came back the next week, and he said, well, it said he took me about four or five hours to figure out how it works, and it took me about four or five hours to break it. <laughs> Interesting. Now that, that was it. And of course, once you break it, you, you, don't, you don't just get into one software, you get into all the software that's protected by it. <coughs> so we thought, gee, that <laughs> doesn't sound like a very good deal. And we'd spent some time looking around, you know, there were a lot of companies in the software licensing business and sure. so forth. And of course, their ads were saying how wonderful it was. But basically, uh, they would not prevent somebody who was sharp, and this guy was was very sharp, uh, but he wasn't. A, he had never studied software security before. True. Uh, um, you know, wouldn't keep them out very long. So we said, "Well, I wonder just if we can do something better than that." And we we fritzed around talking back and forth for a few months, and then we decided we would try to do something with some ideas, and we got a. Uh, one of these uh, state grants, I've forgotten the name of them now. Anyway, I think it was a million dollars or something to spend over a year or two. And we actually got a programmer and a couple more graduate students and tried to develop ideas. And we came across the uh, uh, idea, which we weren't the only ones who have done it, but uh, of having a software that defends itself so that, you know, you can't fiddle with it. And wow. That's after, great. That's a breakthrough. <laughs> <laughs> and we came up with a number of ways, and it's now really uh, uh, quite practical to make software that uh, uh, it's called tamper proving. If you tamper with it, it stops working. Okay. And uh, so that was what we were headed for. We, the word that really wasn't around yet uh, for software. Tamper proving is an old word, of course, but. Um, so we got a, this grant, and then we got a little bit of venture capital money, and then we got a lot more capital money, and uh, yeah. made this company called Arxan. Uh, we had a great difficulty in naming a company. As you might guess, if you actually go out to start to name a new company, you discover all the reasonable names of our, are taken. <laughs> I hear you. And so we, we spent we fritzed around a long time, uh, and I actually came up with the name Arxan. I got out a uh, big atlas, and I went through the index looking at the names of places for something that sounded good, and I saw the word Arxan. It's short, and it's different, and then I looked to see where it is. It's a, it's a city in China. <laughs> And uh, so anyway, that's where the name came from. And in fact, it turns out Arxan is, uh, has a, uh, a long history as a name. It's not, uh, it's not something that's w well known. If you weren't interested in Arxan, you'd never dig it out. But sure. 
in, in medieval times in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe, there were uh, supposedly beings or super powers or what who were called Arxan. Oh, interesting. <laughs> you know, That's good like, that you sort of checked it, checked it through. Yeah. yeah. So what, what, once we decided on the name, we spent more time. We dug that up, but sure. uh, that was that that just a coincidence. It really, it just came from. It was a good sounding name that we thought was new. <laughs> And it, it's catchy. It, it draws your attention, and that's what right. you want. You know, if right. you don't want anything yeah. like everybody's seen it, run of the mill. Yeah. Is it and where is it located? In uh, it has uh, an office here. Oh. There are around uh, forty people in the in the office here. The total workforce is over a hundred now. It's there were venture capitalists brought in money and so forth, and now the the founders are no longer more than just consultants to the company. Sure. Uh, but it has uh, over 100 people working for it now, and it's, uh, it's still growing. Uh, are you still on the board? I'm not, I'm not, none of the founders are on the oh, board okay. of directors. Okay. The uh, venture capitalists, once, once they get a hold of it, they're in control. Oh, they're in charge. <laughs> <laughs> After all, that, it's their their sure. money, <laughs> right? I understand. <laughs> right. Oh, uh, I would. I forgot. Um, I want yeah. to compliment you. You've got several patents too, mm -hmm. and uh, that's very nice. Right. You know, it's yeah. nice to have yeah. those. And it, it's um, mm -hmm. the last one, the most recent one you just got in April. Mm -hmm. Method and system for secure computational outsourcing in disguise. Right. They're they're related to software security. Sure. And, uh, very. The flu, uh, Arxan and Purdue, because we actually started applying for patents before Arxan was really off the ground. Because uh -huh. we were interested in computer security. Sure. So. Very and, nice. Uh, How uh, about uh, family? You want to mention uh, you have a couple of children, I understand. Yeah, I have two daughters. Uh -huh. Did they go to Purdue? Uh, uh, yes, sort of. Okay. My uh, oldest daughter, she was born in California, and she's, even though she grew up in Indiana, she never accepted that she was a <laughs> Indiana Hoosier. So when she graduated from high school, she headed for California and has never come back, <laughs> basically. So she went to uh, UCLA and got a law degree from USC, and she's a lawyer in, in Los Angeles in a mm -hmm. uh, family law firm. My other daughter had a more... Uh, varied experience, but uh, she lives here in town. She's uh, has ended up uh, getting a master's degree in psychology, and she's a, a counselor, you know, people that have emotional problems sure. and so forth, and in private practice here in town. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's nice that she stays close to home. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you've got a number of hobbies and special interests. you want to, any particular one that you want to comment on? Well, I think uh, my biggest hobby and interest is traveling. I like to go places. Where's uh, next on the agenda? You've uh, been in many places, but then it's sometimes it's nice to go back. Yes, but there's always places you haven't been. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot on my list. It's quite, a, quite extensive. <laughs> well, let me say, just uh, I have uh, one, two, three, four trips already scheduled for the rest of this year. Okay. Do you want to tell us where they're, where well, they're dropping off to? Um, end of next week, I'm going to Texas. With uh, My wife is dead, and I have a girlfriend. Okay. And we're visiting her stepchildren who live in Texas okay. for a few days. And then uh, uh, she and I and my two daughters are going to London to the wedding of Bob Lynch. I remember he, he's retired now, he lives in Iowa, but his granddaughter's getting married in London. So we decided we'll go to the wedding and spend the week in London. <laughs> it's not your everyday occurrence, right? Right. Um, and then uh, the, the big event is uh, we're going on a cruise 63-day cruise to the end of the year. We're going to start from Seattle and go north around Alaska, Russia, 
Korea, China, Japan, Vietnam. It'll be cold though, won't it? It'll be cool? Where the boat actually doesn't stop up north. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm not one for cold weather, but yeah. okay, sounds good. Uh, and all the way down to Indonesia and then through some islands in Australia and New Zealand and back wow. to the States. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's wow. Yeah. Just send me a postcard. Pardon? You'll send me a postcard. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Very nice. Okay. Yeah. Do you have an outstanding event that you'd like to share with us? Outstanding event. Anything that comes to mind? Oh. Be, doesn't have to necessarily be Purdue. Anything that comes to mind? Well, there's the obvious things like getting married and such okay. things. Okay, there that. you go. Well, those are very good. Yeah. And many, that's very nice. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Computer science in the 21st century on education. Any comments on that? How's it changed or what? As you look back and look ahead. Well, um, I think I mentioned I was already interested in computing in, in, sure. in right. very early. And I think we haven't seen anything yet with, <laughs> with right. computers. Uh, I got interested in computing by, because I was a fan of science fiction. I read a lot of science fiction. Uh -huh. And there's a guy who writes science fiction who is really, uh, he, he died a few years ago, Arthur C. Clarke. I don't know oh, if you've sure. heard. Oh, sure, right, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, he, that guy had so much Wrote Vision. extensively on this. Oh yeah, right. and uh, you know he, he's, you know, uh, computers are going to be smarter than people, and uh, it's it's definitely it's hard to to appreciate it, but you know underneath we're so smart because we got the computing power in our head, <laughs> and, that, and that's that's what it is, and mm -hmm. uh, we will the computers will. Uh, uh, but an example of Clark's foresight, you know, these stationary geosatellites, they were invented by him in a science fiction story in 1947. I mean, you know, in those days, nobody was thinking about that kind of thing. Well, reading about it or saying anything at all, yeah. you know? And Interesting. He that's one of the, and, uh, he, there were, he's behind a movie called 2001, which was very popular. Right. He wrote a book called 3002, which hasn't received the kind of notoriety that 2001 has. But he has a vision to what life is going to be in 3002 in that book. And he has a nice, interesting story involved sure, in it. Sure, right. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a very uh, interesting, I think very oh, to read. That forts, sounds, yeah. foresightful about, uh, well, the kind of thing, you know, we're all uh, uptight about privacy. He says in 3002, everyone will have a chip in their palm of their hand. You shake hands with somebody when you meet them. These two chips exchange personal information. That guy now knows what you made in third day math when you had your first date, who with, <laughs> wow. and Oops. he makes the case that, you know, we're used to hiding all this information, but when push comes to shove, that kind of information isn't really that important. It's, it's yeah. well, tentilating, it. but it's, right. and uh, besides you won't be able to hide it anyway. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, yeah. Another kind of thing he talks about, you'd be walking down the street and the uh, Signs on the building advertising, you know, the grocery store or the beer or so forth. They'll talk to you as you go by and say, hello, Mr. Rice, would you like a can of this beer? I know you like this kind of beer. Or they'll know what kind of things you drink and all that kind of stuff. It's really... Um, that is food for thought. Good. Yeah. And uh, the world is wall-to-wall -wall people. And he yeah. describes how, uh, you know, we think we're, things are crowded now describes how, you know, we will be able to survive with 100 times as many people as yeah. we've got now right. or something. Yeah. He doesn't really say how many it is, but you hear his description. I mean, you know, it's really uh, everywhere. I, pro I probably should check that out since I'm not going to be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I'd be here to 2000, but I am. Yeah. Um, anything that I forgot to ask or in closing, anything that you would like to summarize? I don't know. You? Thank you. Let me just see. You had this long list. 
I think we have so most of them covered. Computer science and books and... And you responded, which was kindly. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think you've, that seemed to be everything. Okay, yeah, that, good. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Rice, for this opportunity well, to conduct this interview. Thank you.